in our series over the gospel, in week one, I talked about how the gospel is prevalent for life. And we talked about the storyline of scripture that God redeems mankind from their sins through Christ. And then we said we would talk about the five core tenets of the gospel. The first being God, man, and then sin uh, as number three. And that's what we're on today. What is sin? Well, sin is an archery term that means missing the mark. And if we're talking about missing the mark, whose mark are we missing? Well, it's, it's God's mark. You see, God has told us in his word that we are called to be perfect, that we are called to be holy. And you and I, we miss holiness every single time when we try on our, on our own. Well, it wasn't always like that. Because as we talked about last week, God created man in his image. God created man to be good and to be holy. And yet we sin against God. How, how do we know that? Well, it's found in the Bible in Genesis chapter 3. Let's look at Genesis 3, 1 through 6. Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees in the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden... God said, you must not eat it or touch it or you will die. No, you will not die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. We see in Genesis chapter 3 that there are two steps that lead us to sin. The first of those steps is that we question or we distort God's truth. You see, Satan tempts Eve in the garden as, as the serpent. He comes up to her. And he, he gets, he, he twists the truth. And he says this, he says, did God actually say, did God actually say, did he really tell you? Okay, so he, he's getting Eve the question if God really said, said something. And, and he said, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any of the fruit, any of the trees? Well, God didn't say that. Actually, for context, if we look back at Genesis chapter 2 in verse 16, it says, And the Lord God commanded the, man, commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for on the day you eat from it, you will certainly die. So God actually had said, You can eat from any of the trees, just not one, just not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But Satan twists and distorts the truth. And the reality is that Satan is right. God did speak about fruit. He did speak about the trees. But, but what happened is God had said, you can have everything but one. And Satan twisted and distorted God's words to saying, you can't have anything. You see, in our own lives, when we falter and we fail, when, when we've gone off the rails, when we sin, it's oftentimes because we question truth. It's because we distort the truth that's found in Scripture. An example of that would be um, fear. You see, you, like myself, may be brought to fear. And in, in God's Word, it says, do not fear, multiple times. In God's Word, He says, trust in me. And yet we fear. We fear the future. We fear for our friends. We fear for our family. We fear for our lives. We are fearful people. And we were created to fear God. We were created to fear his word above our word, above our thoughts. And yet we distort the truth and we say, did God actually say he would be with us? 
And intellectually, a lot of us know that God is with us, right? We, we can assent to the fact that Jesus said he'll be with us always. But when it comes to living life circumstances, we let fear take over. We doubt that God is truthful. And, and so what happens then is instead of living by the principles of Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Instead of leaning into that truth and leaning into those principles, relying on the Lord and trusting the Lord, we begin to trust in ourselves. Did God actually say to trust him? Because I don't see where God is, is helping me right now. I don't, I don't see how God is in this circumstance. And so we begin to doubt. We begin to fear. And we begin to question God's word. We begin to distort his truth. You know what? God said it's not good to lie. But in this circumstance, lying's going to get me out of whatever repercussions I'm going to have. So I'm going to lie to my mom. I'm going to lie to my dad. That's a lie straight from Satan. That's a lie that you're buying just like Eve bought. You see, we distort the truth. We question the truth. And that's the first step. We question God's words. But the second step is even worse. Because you can, you can question God's words, but if you come back to the truth knowing that this is God's word and I'm going to follow it and I'm going to believe it, you're okay. But when we question and when we distort God's truth, when we lie to ourselves or to others about God's word, that's when we go astray. And that leads us to the second step towards sin, and that is prideful self-worship. You see, in, in verse 4 of chapter 3, essentially, what, what Satan is saying is that you will not die, but yes, yes, they will die. They do die. Spoiler alert. We all die because of this sin. But Satan, Satan tempts them and, and has them question God. He says, no, no, no. You, God doesn't know what he's talking about. You're not going to die. God actually loves himself more than he loves you. And so you need to eat this fruit because he's keeping something back from you. No, God doesn't know what's best for you. You know what's best for you. Take it. You'll be like God. You will be God. That is a straight up lie. And so in the first step towards sin, there's a fight for truth. Are we going to believe God's truth or are we going to believe what we want to believe about God's truth? Are we going to believe and distort the real truth? Here, in the second step towards sin, there's a fight for worship. There's a fight for worship because here, Satan is tempting Eve and he's tempting Adam and he says, no, you know what's best for you. And despite that God created everything, that God gave them the very breath that they were breathing at that moment, despite the fact that God was holding all their atoms and all their cells together, despite the fact that God had given them life, they question God's words and they worship themselves. You see, God knew what was best for them. His plan was for them to dwell with him forever and to spread the image of God throughout the ends of the earth. And yet, what did they do? They sin against a holy God who demands holy perfection. All for self-worship. And you know, it is true, it is true that God loves himself. Uh, we see that in the Trinity, that the Father loves the Son, the, loves, the Son loves the Spirit. God, God loves himself, but he loves himself so much that he knows that it would be best to share himself with others. And that's why he created man and woman. That's why he created us, to know him, to walk with him, to be with him, to be in his presence, to see how great and wonderful he is, and to be like him, his way. 
But Eve and Adam and you and me, we buy into the lie that we can serve ourselves better than God can serve us. We believe in the lie that we know ourselves better than God knows us. We believe that we love ourselves more than God loves us. And nothing could be further from the truth. God is too great to just love himself. God is too great. You see, God loves you more. God loves you more and more perfectly than you will ever know. And he loves you more and more perfectly than you will ever love yourself. And yet think about the lies of the world. The world tells you to follow your heart. The world tells you that you know what is best for you. The world says, do whatever your heart desires. And that's sin. And the majority of the world is going to say, here's this fruit, here's this fruit, take it and eat it. And we can't act like we don't like that fruit. We can't act like we don't take that fruit and eat it and enjoy it because it looks good. I mean, look at verse 6 in Genesis chapter 3. It's not that the fruit of the knowledge of the, uh, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it's not like that fruit was bad. Eve says that it was delightful to look at. It was desirable for obtaining wisdom and that the tree was good for food. Three good things about that fruit. But why was the fruit bad? Why couldn't she eat the fruit? Because God had said, don't do this. Life will operate better for you. You you won't die if you don't eat this fruit. Just like sin. Sin is enticing. Sin looks good. Sin is like excrement covered in whipped cream. It looks good until you discover what's actually in it, until you discover what it actually is. And it's disgusting and it's putrid. And that's what sin is. Sin is vile. It is vile, prideful self-worship. You see, because we tell God when we, when we take a bite of that sin, when, when we enjoy sin, we don't taste and see that the Lord is good. We taste and we say, I am good. I know better than God. God doesn't care about me like I care about me. God doesn't know me like I know me. God doesn't know this situation like I know this situation. You see, self, prideful self-worship is at the root of every single sin. Think about this. Why do we lie? We lie because it serves us. We, we tell lies because it makes us look smarter. We we tell lies because it gets us out of a certain circumstance. Why do we covet? Why do we look at our neighbor's truck and say, man, oh, I love that truck. I wish I had that. Why do we look at other people's clothes or other people's belongings, their house, their, their family, their brains, their athletic prowess? Why do we look at them and say, man, I, I wish I had that? Not because we're loving our neighbor. Not because we're fulfilling the second greatest commandment after love God, we're called to love our neighbor. It's not because we love God so much that, oh man, God, I I want that truck because I love you so much. We covet because we love ourselves. And why do we steal? We steal because we covet. We, We steal because we think that we deserve whatever that person has, whatever that institution has. So we, when we're little, we steal cookies from the cookie jar. Because we think we know better than our our parents. We know better than our mom. That that chocolate chip cookie is going to taste a lot better before dinner, not after dinner. That chocolate chip cookie is, is, tastes way better, so it has to be better for you than the broccoli that you have, or uh, that you're going to have for dinner, right? And so we do what we want to do in our heart, and we sin. It's the same thing with lust. We don't lust after others because we love them so much. We lust after others because we think they can serve us. We sit on the throne of our hearts as our gods and we say, it's all about me. Even though many of you have trusted in Jesus, many of you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, 
And yet you sit on the throne of your heart every time you sin. And it is an affront on the glory of God. It is an affront to him because what you have done when you sin, every single time you sin, is you set yourself up as your idol. You are your God and you will worship yourself. And you see, when we worship ourselves, we go after self-satisfaction and self-fulfillment. And the thing is, we weren't created to fulfill our needs. We weren't created for self-satisfaction. We were created to be satisfied in God. We were created to know God on a deep level and to be fulfilled in Him. And yet, when we sin, we ostracize ourselves from God. When we sin, we, we seek self-satisfaction and, and the allurement of this world. And the world can look really good. The world can provide power or, or fortune. The world can provide the things that we want, but they leave temporary satisfactions. And so we chase temporary satisfaction after temporary satisfaction after temporary satisfaction, never able to fill the void that can only be filled by a holy God knowing him and being loved by him. And we settle for self-worship when we could be worshiping a wonderful God. And this prideful self-worship results in death. This prideful self-worship is just like these vines. These vines were growing around some of my trees. It's English ivy. And, and this, I just cut off a little section. And this English ivy is, is growing around this tree in, it, in, it, in my backyard, and it's suffocating it. So Hebrews 12.1 tells us that, that sin so easily entangles us. And if you think about your heart in your heart, you pick a sin. So you lie. It's just a little lie. But it starts to get around your heart. It starts to make sure that you're seated on your throne. And you add in sin after sin after sin after sin. And just like an anaconda in the Amazon rainforest, it kills us. It destroys us. And the Bible tells us that we're called to rid ourselves of what so easily can entangle us, but it entangles us, and it's, it's hard. It's hard to rid ourselves of sin. I'm, I'm told this. I, I don't have any necklaces. But I'm told for, for you girls, you guys have necklaces, and, and if you move it or if you put your necklace in wrong, your necklaces can get tangled together. And it's an extremely frustrating thing trying to untangle your necklaces. Sin entangles our hearts. It turns our affections away from the God who made us and loves us and turns our affections inward to our heart, but it also kills us. And, and, and it doesn't just kill us physically. I mean, there is death, there's disease in this world. We grow old and, and, and we get tired and our bodies fail, yes, physically because of sin. And, and every sin in this world is a result, or every bad thing in this world is a result of sin. But, but it also kills us spiritually. Spiritually, we die. As Ephesians 2.1 says, that you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked. You, you see, we die spiritually. And it's not that we're just floating in the water waiting for someone to, to throw us a, a, a tube that we might be saved. No, we are dead, dead at the bottom of the sea. And the only thing that can save us is the resurrecting power of Jesus Christ. The only thing that can resurrect our souls and our hearts to have affection and love for Christ is if Jesus Christ, if God himself in the form of Jesus Christ comes down and rescues us. And God promises to do that. We've talked about the gospel before. You guys have heard the gospel before, that Jesus is a perfect God, that, that Jesus came to earth to live a perfect life as God and man, that he died on the cross uh, according to scriptures for your sins and for my sins, and that he was raised again on the third day. 
And it's only through his resurrecting power that we can be saved. You know why? Because Adam and Eve sinned, sin has come into the world. And we are sinners. That is our nature. Not that we just learn how to sin. No, not that we just learn how to sin, but sin is our nature. Romans chapter 3 tells us this. In Romans 3, starting in verse 10, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. All alike have become worthless. There is no one who does what is good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They deceive with their tongues. Vipers' venom is under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and wretchedness are in their paths. And the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Sin is imputed to us. That means we inherit it. Inherit it. That means that it's passed along. Even though we weren't in the garden, we all receive the sinful nature of Adam and Eve. And that sinful nature turns our hearts away from God. We don't even seek after him, as Romans chapter 3 tells us. We're told elsewhere in Scripture that the heart, our human heart, is deceitful above all things. And that even our good works are as filthy rags. We stand as wretches. We stand as sinners in need of a Savior. And Romans 6.23 tells us that because of our sin, because of our self-worship, we deserve death. Death. Eternal death. Forever death. Forever being apart from an eternal God who made us and knows us and loves us. And yet we spat in his face. We reject his goodness every single time we sin. And it is a front on the glory of God. And because God's glory is at stake, he will kill those who find themselves as sinners. He will destroy them forever in hell. That's a scary reality. It's a scary reality because Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, tells us this. But the cowards, faithless, detestable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their share will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Not just we die physically, but we die eternally forever. Sin creeps in and it separates us from an eternal loving God. It comes in and it tells us that because we are prideful self-worshippers, we've set ourselves up as idols, we are idolaters, and because we are liars, we twist the truth of God's word in our own lives and in others' lives. Because we do that, we are destined to go to the lake of fire and sulfur to burn forever in a second death. That's our reality because of sin. That is our reality. That is every human's reality. And in the gospel, in the five core tenets of the gospel, this is the darkest tenet. There is no hope for sinners apart from God. If only God would have grace for sinners. And he gives us that grace. And it will be my privilege to tell you next week about that glorious grace that is in Jesus Christ. But I want you to consider this. When you live your life, when you're at home with your family, when you're with your friends, when you're at school, when you're at work, when you're playing sports, when you're part of your orchestras or your choirs, and when you twist God's word 
when you distort his word, when you doubt his word, and when you conveniently lie, or you conveniently covet, or you steal, or you lust, that is an affront on the glory of God. It is vile and it is putrid in his sight. His demand is that we be holy and perfect. And we sin because we miss 